Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell Lepp. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Robert Vera, author of A Warrior's Faith, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, yes, we have Robert on the show. And of course, I have Scott sitting with me co-hosting. He's best-selling author of Echo and Ramadi. And we're about to have another great conversation with another person telling incredible. These these warrior tales, I'm so glad. And Scott, you were the one that really got me thinking about this. We're telling our tale in our time now. Instead of being crusty or gone, you know, like we're taking the moment right now to slow down and go, this is what it costs to do this war stuff, you know, so... You want to protest, you want to, but there's actual people that go. This is what it means to do it, and I love that we're doing this now. So thank you for uh, for telling the tale that you did. And gosh, just, you know, just thanks for – I love doing this show. You know, like, yeah, I, I, I love it. You know, what's, you know what's important, too, is that because a lot of our listeners, we get a bunch of veterans on the show, is what's so amazing about Robert. And Robert is, again, one of my favorite pen pals. And you've probably heard me say this, true confession. Robert and I have never sat down in a room like you and me. But we have this great relationship. We talk all the time. Uh, Robert like actually likes to talk more than me. So <laughs> it's it's really it's relief because I can just sit back and in every time I'm on the phone with Robert, it's amazing because it's a little bit of therapy, it's a little bit of education, and it's uh, a little bit of a lot of wisdom. Robert's a, a civilian. He's done amazing things in his life, but he shared this great story of our veteran community and of our warriors. And you know, Robert, hey, it's always good talking to you, brother. Yeah, thanks, man. It's great to have, I love talking with you and it's, we're like-minded. So, yeah. So, um, you know, when I first read Scott's book, so I was, before it was launched and I, you know, before you press the button and launch a book, like you're always like, Oh man, you know, is this going to go over well? I mean, you just don't know. Right. And as soon as I read it, I was like, this is absolutely going to be a bestseller. There's no question about it. I, I mean, it was. It had everything in it to make it a bestseller. It was a great story. But I'll tell you what, you know what I, you know what I thought was much different about um, Echo and Ramadi than I thought about a lot of other books is that Scott actually, um, not that others don't, but, you know, Scott continues to lead, right? So afterwards, he's doing the work, you know, with his Marines after he got out of the civilian. Still, you know, save the brave, still doing work with his nonprofit. He still continues to lead other Marines in, in civilian life when they're in civilian life. So it's not like he, he ever left the military, right? He's still doing the work. I think that's true leadership. And that's a part of the book I don't think people realize, that Scott's still out there doing the leadership work with his Marines, which I think is amazing work. So, But yeah, thanks thanks, thanks really for, for your work and what you do, and, and thanks for having me today. For those of you guys who don't know um, the story of Ryan Job. Since I wrote A Warrior's Faith, I think Ryan Job has been in six or seven other books, including um, Extreme Ownership by Jocko and Leif Babin. Um, I think there's another one by um, Punisher, uh, The Last Punisher by Kevin Lance. Um, he was in a bunch of Dick Couch's, Dick Couch's former SEAL, who's written a few books, um, quite a few books, about um, the Sheriff Romati. Ryan Job, for, for those folks that have watched the, um, the film American Sniper, there were a number of Ryan as the character Biggles. Him and Chris were on a rooftop. Chris Guy were on a rooftop in Ramadi, Iraq. And Ryan got, um, it was early morning, it was like eight in the morning. And Ryan got shot in the face by a sniper. The bullet actually hit the upper receiver of his weapon. He was on a, um, I think a 240 Bravo, but hit the upper receiver of his weapon. Fragments of it shattered into the right side of his face and just completely tore open the right side of his face. Uh, knock him out. I mean, Chris thought he was dead. I remember talking to Chris about it. You know, Chris told me, I, I like, I, I called over to him and, you know, he wouldn't answer. So I, so we were getting shot at now and I knew that, you know, he probably got shot by the sniper that I heard. And I was like, now, yeah, well, I'm either going to get shot up there in the loop. Uh, if I'm going to do that, I might as well go help Ryan. So we ran over, grabbed Ryan, turned him over and Ryan just had this massive head wound from his lip to his forehead and his eye was gone. Chris knew from the color of the blood that it was bad. He called down um, to the team that was working below. They were doing some clearing below, house to house. 
they all came up. They were getting shot at. They moved to a part of the roof where, you know, they weren't get, they wouldn't get shot. You know, they, they literally thought he was dead. I mean, Johnny Kim was a medic working on Ryan and, uh, they're trying to bring him back. He was out late stabbing with holding his hand. Johnny told me the story. He's like, yeah, you know, Ryan just coughed up a bunch of blood and gore when I was working on him and, you know, sat up or tried to sit up. And Lake had his hand. Lake was saying, come on, Ryan, you know, we we'll get you out of here. You're going to be all right, guy. Come on. Johnny had to say to Lake, because Lake was amazed that Ryan was actually alive and sat up. And Johnny had to say to Lake, you know, hey, sir, please let go of his hand. We got to get out of here. And Ryan um, got up. He evacuated himself. Johnny and, and Ryan took a track over to Charlie Medical, which is at Camp, Camp Ramadi. Ryan went for surgery there. You know, he had some swelling. It was pretty bad. Subsequently lost his sight and both. He lost one eye and his other eye. And that's, that's literally what happened to Ryan. I mean, people think he died right afterwards, but he lived, he ended up living in Arizona, not far from me. One of my buddies from college actually went through buds with Ryan. That's how I initially met him. And we just became good friends. He was a good guy. We just, we trained together, climbed Mount Rainier, took him elk hunting. He's a really, really great guy. Just a hard charger. He just, let me make sure that we're clear for the audience on this, too. We're talking about you and Ryan Job, who's blind, going elk hunting and climbing Mount Rainier yeah. and all these things. Because that's important, yeah. because all of a sudden, so, it's like, wait, his buddy from Buds? Yeah. No, no, no. It's like yeah, Him, too, but also this, uh, this seal badass who, yeah, like you said, in the constraints of a movie, you've got to use certain people, certain characters to accomplish certain things. And so, yeah, Biggles has to die. But in this case... Ryan Job survives for, for a number of years and does incredible things for a guy that, for all intents and purposes, should be dead. It's, uh, man, yeah, yeah wow. It's incredible. I mean, so, he, I mean, he climbed right near. I mean, if you ever seen right near, if you ever flown into um, Seattle, like, you can't, you can't not miss it. It dominates the, the skyline. So he, he climbed right near, completely unassisted, just, you know, just climbed up right near, totally blind. A couple months later, he called me. He's like, "Hey, can you give me a ride to the airport?" Because I would take him to the airport all the time, just drive him. So I was like, "Yeah, get in the car." I'm like, "Hey, where are you headed?" He's like, "Oh, elk hunting." <laughs> so um, <laughs> of course, I was you like, are. "Hey, you know, you got to see him to hunt him, right?" He's like, "Yeah, yeah, I got that figured out." And then <laughs> hand to hand combat. I was like, "Hey, Ryan, you, <laughs> yeah." I was like, "Ryan, you you may not want to tell the other hunters that you're blind. <laughs> you know, those, those guys may." Uh, and, you know, a couple of days later, he just texted me in this photo of this, this massive elk he missed it with one shot. And, you know, they, they had brought a gun into Best Buy, got an internet camera, put it in the scope, attached that to like a laptop or something. I wasn't with him when this happened, but he crimped around the woods and, and shot an elk. It's just an incredible guy. I just like literally did not, it was more of an inconvenience. Just, just a, just a great guy. Um, so yeah, then sadly he had some complications. Uh, the the hospital had some complications, frankly, um, with his surgery. He went in for a surgery in 2009. Had some complications. It was a, a fairly egregious medical error, and Ryan passed as a result of of um, the recovery process of surgery. And that's how Ryan. It's Ryan a bit died. of a. You, you just gave a, a spoiler for the book that's been out for a long time. But <laughs> I'm telling you, if you haven't read A Warrior's Faith, it, it you're the, the way you tell the story, Robert, is it's 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 masterful. I mean, there's no other word I can use to describe it. It's, I have a hard time reading books to begin with just because I have short attention span theater. But yours is one of a handful of books that, like, I picked it up and I just couldn't put it down. And it's one of those things, too, where you not only share, the, you know, Ryan's story, but so many other interesting facts that are very unique because they're seen through your lens, through someone that didn't serve in the military. And I think that's powerful because when I was reading through this, it's like knowing you and having to, to personally know the author when you read someone's work is, yeah, it's, it's really cool. I, I mean, you think like, oh, I could call this guy and ask him about chapter six. And like, what did you mean when you said this? Yeah. But the way the story is told and all of the other elements that, you know, go into the story and then come out of the story as you, as you read a warrior's faith are so powerful. And, you know, one of the things that is uniquely, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm stumbling over my words here, but that connection you have with, with not only Ryan, but those he fought with and then his family, like his, his brother, um, Aaron and his mom, uh, Debbie, right. And then that connection, 
you know, talk about how they played a part in sharing this story because I think that's really important to when you share a story like Ryan's, the family. Yeah, I mean, it, it was, you know, like, it's, I don't think civilians get this. I mean, like, if you're a civilian, like, you don't know how good you have it here in this country. You really don't. People say that all the time, but, you know, when you, when you talk to guys that have served and you, you, you're sort of friends with them, you hear their stories and, um, you see how grateful they are that they're still alive. You know what I mean? And able to live in this country. Um, it's really powerful. Like you, it's a great education. Um, and what, what was really for me really interesting is that, you know, I became good friends with Ryan's friends just because when, when you leave the military, you sort of estrange from, from, from really the, the family, the second family you had. And I was like, I mean, it was just me and Ryan, right? He, I mean, Chris would come in, the guys would come in, but they'd be in for like a day and leave. So me and Ryan just became good friends. We became pretty close. And, um, when, when Ryan passed, I was, uh, frankly, this, this is how it happened. I get to the hospital, right? And they, they're trying to tell us, I was with his wife and his mom. His mom had been in to Arizona. She, they were from Isco, Washington. And they tried to tell us that he, he operated on shooting tobacco. And I mean, I knew Ryan really well. We had spent a lot of time together, training together. I mean, he had swallowed chewing tobacco on occasion. What was just, you know, it's Copenhagen without any problems whatsoever. And I knew that, that it would probably be pretty difficult for him to aspirate on chewing tobacco. So their story just didn't like sound right. So I started to ask more, you know, sort of very direct pointed questions about the process. And, and then I asked to see him. So I go into his hospital room and obviously, I mean, it's, it was a really sad time for me personally, just seeing your friend there and there's nothing you can do, but, but there's, there's something I can do and I need to figure out what that is because I'm not sure what it is. So I, I check his body, like just to make sure that, you know, like where is the chewing tobacco, right? And there was nothing. I, you know, I check his hands and I, then his phone rings and I open his bag and in the bottom of his bag is literally a full tin of dip. It was not even opened really. I, at that point, I just knew that, that the truth was not being told. So I called my attorney. I was like, look, um, you know, somebody's not telling the truth here. I don't care who it is, but let's just, you know, get to the bottom of it. You know, whoever you got to, frankly, whoever you got to sue, well, you know, if they don't have a problem, there shouldn't be a problem, right? So he ended up doing that. And I, I was pretty persistent about it, too, to, I think, to a point where people are like, well, you know, they're all professionals. This doesn't really usually happen. I'm like, look, my gut's telling me that something's not right here. You know, somebody's lying. I don't know who, but let's just find out. And if nobody's lying, then nobody's got a problem. We'll just trust and verify. So that resulted in a lawsuit, which resulted in the fact that um, we did find out through, a, through an autopsy, which the hospital tried to deny, that Ryan, he didn't aspirate on chewing tobacco. The contents in his stomach wasn't chewing tobacco, and the fact that he did have five times the amount of fentanyl in his system needed to kill him. Somebody overdosed him. Whether it was intentional or unintentional, I don't know. So through that process, which was, you know, fairly significant, about a year, I, you know, I would keep in touch with everybody and just sort of get them out of case. It was my lawyer who was the lawyer for the, um, for the, at least my contact with the lawyer was the lawyer for the case. So I kept in contact with all of them and I would keep them updated and they would ask me sort of, you know, what's going on. I think Ryan's death was very hard on people because, I mean, Mark Lee was killed um, right after Ryan was. A lot of people literally risked, I mean, Scott, you know how bad Ramadi was. I mean, it, it, it was bad. People risked their lives going out in the bush every day. I mean, they were, once you left the wire, I mean, even the wire wasn't necessarily that safe. People risked their lives go out to do work every day and to have that happen to Ryan was was really hard for people um so I just kept in touch with them to keep them you know informed and, and give them my sort of thoughts on things so we we became very close um, um you know me and Aaron which is Ryan's brother who's a he's a sheriff King County Sheriff up in Washington came very close when Ryan's Aaron's third child I'm his godfather we just came, came really close because of that process of, of um, you know, I think, I think what happened to Ryan, sort of just taking care of his family, taking care of, of what happened, because there was nobody to really, nobody really knew. You know, no one really knew what to do. I mean, I was sort of, I don't think anybody's equipped 
uh, for that sort of, you know, sudden death in a hospital as a result of a, a, a hospital error. And nobody was really equipped with it. And this, I think one of the saddest facts was Ryan's wife was pregnant with their first child and nobody knew it, but, but really me. Wow. So I became close to them because of this just circumstances and who Ryan was and our closeness. And he was just a really, um, just a really good guy. You know, he just, he just charged hard at everything. And, and to the fact that when one of the guys, I mentioned John Kim, who was the medic on the roof with Ryan, he, he, um, he literally saved Ryan's life. I had tracked down the physicians who worked on Ryan who were at Camp Ramadi. Um, I tracked him down to civilian life and asked him about, you know, do they remember Ryan? They went, he would, the, the guy who worked on him remembered him. And, um, he said, yeah, it was probably the worst wound I've, facial wound without being dead I've ever seen. And, um, the- you said something really cool when we first started talking about the family was the, the military becomes a second family. And I, I always argue that sometimes for a lot of veterans, it's their first family because they come from so many different backgrounds demographically. A lot of them from traditionally broken home, yeah. not a nuclear family. So they don't enjoy that type of love and support and structure that the military provides to people who serve. And in, in a case like Ryan or any of the other other guys he was on the team with, especially in the SEAL community, it is super tight knit community. I think that that lends itself to the importance of sharing his story within a very exclusive community. And then the importance of involving the family, because it wasn't just whether it's on the battlefield or in a hospital room that, that one soldier or sailor dies, but they leave behind the families and to stay connected to them, I think is really powerful. And I think that's really, you know, you, you mentioned how I stay connected and continually, you do the same thing and keeping these people connected through, through what we do and all the same people we know, I think has been something extremely gratifying. So, yeah, I, you know, I think it's, I think as a civilian, it's, it's, I hear people say all the time, civilians, oh, my only regret mm. is that, that I didn't serve in the military. I'm like, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Let me break this down. You mean to think, to say that that's, the, <laughs> you know, that's the only thing that, like, you know, you think that's the only way you can serve your country or fellow man is to go into the military? Like, literally, like, you, I mean, that's it? Like, and so I think from my perspective is that, so people ask, well, what's the VA doing? Or what's, well, what are you going to do? Like, what are you going to do? Like, you, you like, you can do something. And my sort of response to that was, I will be a conduit to resources on the outside world. So when you were out there fighting, right, I was building a network of resources, of people, of connections. Here's what I'll do. When you come back, I'll lend those resources to you to make sure that you're connected too. And I think that's really valuable to have the right relationships in your life. If you don't, life gets very difficult very fast. And there's more wrong relationships than right relationships. So in coming back with Ryan, a lot of the other guys that I work with, they've spent the last decade or more, you know, fighting wars, right? Estranged from family and friends. And they don't have the right uh, trusted relationship to get them to the night, to the next level. But, but I just tell you something really interesting, you know. You're right, Scott, that that family dynamic of the military. You know, my next my next upcoming book is with a guy named Mike Day, who I actually met through Ryan Joe. And, and Mike was wounded um, shortly after Ryan was. He was wounded in 07. Ryan was wounded in 06. Mike, I was a SEAL, spent many years there in the SEAL community. In 07, he was wounded, shot 27 times um, in a small room. Um, literally, One, yeah, two, 20, seven. 27 times. I mean, it's an incredible, like literally, I was like, Mike, I, I, when I first heard the story, I didn't think it was true, but I've, yeah, he was shot 27 times in a 10 by 10 foot room. The four insurgents were in there with automatic weapons. He didn't get shot with like, you know, he got shot with seven, six twos from 10 feet away, 27 times. That's it's ridiculous. A, Where do you what? even put 27 bullets? I mean, it's, seven, it's, six, two is no joke. Not any round is a joke, but that's a big bullet. Oh yeah, right through him, like literally. And, and while he's getting shot, he's shooting back at them. He killed all four of them. Then got up and walked out of the room. That's man business yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, he's Mike. Mike is a badass, but 
he was a, so he gets flown from it's it's really bad. He you know he gets flown from 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 uh, from Iraq to Germany, and he gets to Germany. And I talked to his casually assistant officer who was working with Mike at the time, and he said, "Yeah, you know, the door opens and it's Admiral McRaven." And he's like, you know, come, comes in to check on Mike because those Mike, when he was, when Mike Day was at Team 3, Admiral McRaven was, you know, the XO at Team 3. And they knew each other. They used to surf all the time in California. So McRaven just walks in like, not like Admiral McRaven, but he's there as the team guy. And he's just asking Mike, you know, hey, how is the care? How's Mike doing? You know, literally, and, and did, literally took off all the, the brass and just, you know, treated Mike and his, his friend who was there accompanying with him, you know, just like team guys and wanted to know, you know, what, what they needed. And that's, I think, unusual, right? Because that was family. It wasn't command. And that's how I saw what happened with Ryan when he died. They gathered around him like family. Um, they wouldn't leave his wife, his widow's side. Um, so, and it becomes the default family for, for many guys. And, and coming back when they leave the military, they don't have that. So, you know, how are, how are civilians, um, going to contribute to meaningful ways in the veteran community? Maybe just being by conduits to resources. Yeah, that's amazing. I think it was, I don't know when we were talking about your, you know, the second book and, uh, telling Dave's story. I think we were introduced or something. I was telling Mike on, I don't know, some messenger like, yeah, next time we're in a firefight, I'm standing right next to you because you're a massive bullet man. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Safest place on the battlefield. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it, uh, yeah, it's just an incredible story. But but stories like that, I mean, you know, I guess I, I've known Mike. In fact, I first met Mike. Uh, we went and climbed in Mount Rainier in Ryan's honor uh, in 2010, and that's when I first met Mike. Me and Mike climbed Rainier with another guy, Jay Redman. We climbed Rainier in and uh, when I was on, that's when I first met Mike. That was back, you know, eight years ago, almost nine years ago. Now. That's when I first met him. Um, but he's, uh, you know, just a really interesting guy. Spent 20 something years in the SEAL teams. Was that deployment, I think, was pretty dangerous. It was 07 and, and, um, pretty dangerous. And he was, you know, he survived what is probably one of the most egregious sort of wounds or multiple wounds you get. I mean, he, and literally he walked to a medevac. His story is, I mean, a story, the, what, I won't give it all away, but the story is incredible. Literally, they're shooting at him. He gets shot in the gun while they're shooting at him. He has to, he has to, you know, clear his weapon and go back to work while they're shooting at him. But yeah, guys are like you, that. You talking about, you talking about Jay Redmond now? No, that's Mike Day. He literally was on the ground get, getting shot. And, but Jay Redmond was wounded going after the guys that shot up Mike. Mike Day. Yeah, and, and again, there's another great story that's out there. Trident by Jason Redman. If that's another great story. Navy SEALs, of course. You were saying something earlier that's really pretty important for folks to realize is those of us that go outside the wire a lot spend our time focused there, and that's where our attention needs to be. You know, I'm out talking to villagers, Scots commanding Marines, trying to take objectives and deciding where to park missiles and stuff like that. Uh, you don't often come back with a powerful professional network. And so if you want to get out of that line of work and you don't necessarily want to work for a contract company or whatever, it it is extraordinarily hard to start to rebuild that network and to convince folks that you actually have some some pretty good skills to apply where it's not just like, yeah, you should guard stuff. Talk to me a little bit about the the kind of, as a civilian talking to these guys, as you start to realize the qualities that are there, you know, like you got people that are operational experts, people that are, there's so many different areas that a veteran has capacity in. You know, you can be, you can be on the teams, but like, think like a, a, a special forces team, you know, you've got a demo expert and that person can literally build a house, build you a bridge. They can look at plans. They can handle budgets. I mean, there are so many different things. What kind of lessons did you learn from talking to all these people that you've interacted with in terms of the skills that they brought that were very transferable, yet nobody knows about it? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question because I think a lot of guys in the military make great entrepreneurs because they are um, they don't look at risk the way other people do. Um, they say, what if I don't do this versus what if I do this? They work, um, to accomplish missions no matter what. They, like, I mean, sometimes you see guys put, like, I'm like, maybe, you know, don't put, 
like like one guy, he was a sniper, and he put on his resume as like sniper, and he's like, you know, he's a, he's a, and I was like, well, it is transferable, like, but I don't think anybody's going to need a sniper at IBM or like you know one of those places. But I think the skill set they almost everyone comes back with is leadership, self leadership, and and these components of leadership. They have physical leadership, meaning they always stay in pretty good shape, like they're always working out. So the physical leadership, mental leadership. They're mentally prepared to go and lead. Um, emotional leadership. Most of the time, they're they're under control. Um, you know, they, they may feel something, but they don't say it. So they're emotionally um, able to lead themselves. Social leadership. Typically, they're socially good leaders, right? They get along with everybody. There's no ego. You know, they check it at the door. Spiritual leadership. Some of them do struggle spiritually um, with some things, but most of them are, are get it. And then I think what what makes them great staff, people, employees, um, entrepreneurs, is by and large that all those things combined create this idea of trust. You can trust them that they're going to show up on time, do the work, get it done. And if you ask me, like, what is the, the, the real currency of leadership? It's trust. And I say this to guys all the time. I say this to people all the time. And, and recently, I sort of, I said this to somebody, and they were leading this organization that had a lot of turnover. And I said, hey, and I just got to let you know, um, people, you know, they fire themselves. What I meant to say to them, and I hope he heard it, was that, you know, people fire their bosses. And they fire their bosses because they don't trust them. And that's what the problem is, is that many people who, are in the, who, who come out of the military, look, I mean, in the SEAL teams, like, I've never been in the military, but everyone tells me, hey, we get to choose who we go in a gunfight with. Like, you don't trust somebody, you don't have to go in a gunfight with them. I mean, it's pretty, like, standard in the SEAL teams. But it's the same place in the workplace. If you don't trust somebody in the workplace, you just don't want to work with them, especially if they're your, they're your boss or your leader. And what I think military guys who get out of the military, what they're able to sort out very quickly is who in the organization they trust and don't trust. What they bring to the organization is a lot of leadership skills to get it done. And if they don't know it, they'll figure out how to get it done or they'll ask how to get it done, which I think are great skills because you can train anybody to, do, to, to be an engineer, but you can't train everybody to be a leader. That you, you, you got to have that, or you got to at least come with the willingness to want to be a leader. So those are the things I think. Um, so transitioning guys up, most of those guys are just they're great leaders. They work hard at things. They may not have the specific skill set like the engineering skill set, the financial skill set. All those things you can learn. In fact, I argue that they're going to change every eighteen months anyway. But you want to find people that are really good leaders that are empathetic that understand sort of how to get things done and tap them. And that's what I think. Or, most or having are, people that are willing to ask how to get it done. I think that's not something that's usually advertised being in the military of uh, the quality of humility and knowing what you don't know. But, it, it, you know, this is kind of a peek behind the curtain in the military. Yeah. There's, there's no at, attribution for, you know, saying, I don't know how to do this. And right. if you don't, you, you just say that, but you feel safe among your peers exposing that, you know, lack of technical or tactical ability. And somebody is there that's done it before you and they'll show you. So you enjoy that in the military. But when you get out, if you got a guy like that in your organization who's willing to say, you know what, I've never done that before. You need to train me how to do that or send me to school to do that or show me how to do it, but I'll get it done. Yeah. There, there's not a lot of people in the private sector that are willing to out themselves and there's also, because I've worked in the private sector, and one of the things that you get in the military, and not that the military is perfect, there's plenty of things, but someone like Scott, who's a commander, as he's in a combat position trying to take down objectives and do all the things he's trying to do, he's also mentoring his officers that are junior to him. He's making sure that careers are being managed properly. He's holding people accountable. There's a lot of things going on. If you go to the civilian side and you ask someone, hey, what's your next promotion? Where, where are you headed next? And I've been surprised at the number of folks are like, I don't know. No one spends any time developing me. So how do you lead someone if if they're like just sitting there waiting to be led, like no one's bothering to tell them? Or that, like you said, we've had Robin Dreek on the show. He's the master of trust. If no one trusts you above you, then you're not going to put your all into it. You're not going to give everything because, you know, as far as you know, especially in corporations and the grant of the military doesn't work this way. You might be given a box the next week. Be like, hey, we decided to cut you loose. You know, we want you all in, but uh, we're not even going to tell you that you're on the chopping block. That's uh, 
that's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, I mean, you know, I tell guys all the time, look, you're in for a two-year assignment, likely, the, the, you know, the military would be the longest career um, employment you'll ever have. After that, you may do two years of two year assignments every place you go because that's just the way things are. Now. I mean, you may not have a career outside. You may do two year assignments at at even if you're a you know not a contractor, just a W two straight employee. You probably just do two year assignments everywhere because that's how fast things change. Well, what do you think about that as far as redefining what a career is? Most people think, well, my career is twenty years. My career is ten years at this. But if you've achieved, we, I think we've talked about this, like if you've achieved all the goals you want within two years, that counts. And every time you transition, it should count for something. Do you, do you agree with that? I totally agree. And, you know, and if you're gaining new um, transferable and tangible skills and, and you think you've sort of out, you've, you've already reached your goal, there's no place for you to go and you're getting bored, you know, now's the time to look. Now it's time to move. Um, or, or the organization will get sold or merged or something like that. So likelihood is, you know, you go hard for two years, you know, keep your head down after two years, pick your head up and see, see what happens. And then that's, that's what's going to, I think even now with technology, uh, with changes we have now, I think that's what the reality is. I don't think even kids getting out of college these days or getting out of school, you know, things are changing so fast. It may not make sense to get a four year degree in anything because by the time you finish school, it's obsolete. So, yeah, that's an, that's an important message, too, that I think for anyone who's senior level, like guys our age, like if they can't wrap their head around that concept that, it, you know, those those traits that you, you bring people in to employ and, and make a successful business. Now, the longevity of the business may be longer than two years, but how to leverage people's skills in there could be relatively shorter. But, you know, we went from an era just for comparison's sake. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at PDA Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Longer than two years, but how to leverage people's skills in there could be relatively shorter. But, you know, we went from an era, just for comparison's sake, of getting a message across from it had to be a book or it had to be an article. And now it's you can get your message out 30 times a day through 26 characters on Twitter. And that evolution and that mindset, if you're not willing to adapt at the senior level right now and understand that, I think those companies are the ones that are going to be taken over and, and really run the risk of failure long term. The- yeah, I mean, I think that these days um, you're going to have to be able to. I, someone asked me, okay, so so what's the skill sets you're going to need? You, you're definitely going to need to be able to communicate. You're going to need to be able to communicate. If you can't communicate, you're going to have a real problem in the career. You know, you know, building a career, and that's both verbal and written communication. Um, you're, you're also going to have to understand that technology is changing literally like we're doubling paces every, every 18 months. So you're going to be, you're going to have to understand that what's available today, 18 months will be completely obsolete. You're going to have to constantly adapt, um, to learn. You're going to have to be willing to learn new things all the time. I think if you do that, you're going to be fine. In fact, I think you'd be very successful. It's the ones that say, well, this is the way we've done it all all along. You know, I don't want to really do it do it a different way. Well, I think you know you're going to be left behind. I mean, that's just the yeah, fact. So how did how did you how did you get there? Through, how did you gain that wisdom? Like, tell tell everybody you know how you got there to really understand this. Like, what what your background is from you know the private sector to you know becoming a best selling author. And, yeah. And working all everything you do with uh, you know your charity. How did you get there? Yeah, so I was, um, well, I graduated in, from college in the 80s, right? Like last year of the 80s, you know? And you know, back then, people had careers. I, I was a political science major, which, by the way, is not very useful, right? There's no, there's no science in politics, right? And um, I, I ended up working for, for a United States senator, and I did military and veteran constituent concerns, right? So any issue that a military veteran had, um, I would just handle it. Um, I worked I, you know, it was apolitical, so it wasn't like 
you know, you're a Republican or a Democrat. Back then it was, was very different. So I ended up being, I was staff assistant to United States Senator Ted Kennedy. Um, worked in Boston for five years doing that work and really enjoyed it. I worked, I worked with the Marines. I worked with, um, you know, I worked with all branches of the military. Usually, I mean, things is Monday and uh, getting a DD-214 to, to really some egregious cases of, of, um, you know, injustice where, you know, malpractice and things like that. And, 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 uh, but nonetheless, really enjoyed the work, had enough of it after five years, didn't want to go to Washington, D.C. and definitely did not want to be in politics. So, um, I ended up going into investment banking and spending, um, almost 20 years as an investment banker. You know, worked in, in Boston, New York, at, and came to Arizona to do an MBA. Um, ended up staying in Arizona, really liking it in Arizona. My last stop on that food chain, the investment banking food chain was, I was at, um, vice president, Merrill Lynch had set up this group. I was vice president of business financial services for Merrill Lynch, which is now part of Bank of America. I left there and, um, right before the crash in 06. But, um, I, I just, I, I wanted to do something totally different. So I had, um, during that time, like from, from like 03, 04, I started getting really sort of, you know, not, I just needed to do something different. I knew, knew I needed to do something different. I didn't know really what it was. So I started doing, I was an athlete in college. I played football. I was, I was, went to Boston College. I was a walk on football player there. I, I was, I always stayed sort of like doing athletics and things like that. So I started doing Ironman triathlon in 03 and really liked it and decided in 06 that I had this crazy idea that I was going to um, set up a workplace wellness company um, using technology to, um, to, to bring, you know, the, the distill sort of some critical tenants of Ironman training, like heart rate zone training and meal planning into the sort of into this sort of non-athlete world and do it in a workplace wellness program. So I literally, like one day I came home, I was like, hey, you know what, honey? Um, I got good news and bad news. She's like, well, what's the uh, good news? I was like, well, I started my own company. She's like, oh, great. What's the bad news? <laughs> I was like, well, I took a 100% pay cut. She's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> great. So I started this technology-based company that um, was literally like o- almost an overnight success. One of those things that took years. We did really well. In 2012, I had an opportunity to um, – I, we, we managed the President's Challenge, which is the initiative of the White House. Did really well. But I was always chasing money and chasing technology because you had to update your browser system as soon as a new browser came out. And people couldn't use their the system. And it was just – so I decided after being, you know, I started off as sort of the, the managing partner. Then, then I ended up being the CTO, then the CEO. I had an opportunity to get out in 2012 and, um, in 2012, 2013, we pay all my investors, get out and sort of start anew. And, you know, I was ready for that. I said, you know, okay, I'll do it. I got out in 2012. Now Ryan had passed and I was really struggling with that whole, like his whole issue of, of, um, how he died, what happened, really struggling. I'd been working, doing some work with a nonprofit, um, that, that assisted wounded veterans. And I just decided one day, you know what? I need to tell the story. Chris, Chris Kyle had told the story, but he, he had said that Ryan died on the operating table, which wasn't true. There was a lot of, you know, sort of people at what happened to Ryan. Didn't he, I heard he died in the operating table and all this other stuff. I just wanted to set the record straight. So literally, I had kept a journal, and I just went back, and I, I rewrote um, the manuscript for A Warrior's Faith. Um, this is interesting for anyone who wants to write a book. I just went and wrote a book. I Literally, I hadn't had any contact, anything. I, I just went and wrote it. I had reached out to somebody that I knew who had offered me offered a book deal for me to do something in the wellness community, and I had sent a manuscript to them, and they, they wanted to do something. But it, it was turned into like a weight loss book. I had no interest in doing that, right? <laughs> so I was like, I'm not interested in doing this. So I said, look, but here's what I am interested in doing. And it, was, it ended up being the manuscript for A Warrior's Face. And they asked me if it was true. I said yes. And a couple, like a week or two later, I got an agent to call me. They looked at it. I got signed by an agent. Um, and then like a month later, I got an offer from Harper Collins, which is literally unheard of, right? So people ask, like, how'd you do? And I said, you know what? I was really lucky. 
I'd like to say I'm talented, but I was really lucky to get that. Um, so, so here's what happened. I don't think I've ever said this to anybody. Like, um, so I, I, finished, do, do, I, I, finished, do, 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 I finished the manuscript, right? And, you know, and Scott said, like, you know, you didn't want to put it down. And I didn't want people to put it down. So I had, I, the, the, the book, A Warrior's Face, is about 42,000 words. However, the, the, the day or the, the Friday before it was due, it was 86,000 words, almost 90,000 words, right? Hmm. So I, um, I call my, I call my editor and I said, Hey, Kristen, you know, can I make some changes? I know it's due today. Can I have some Monday to make, can I have some Monday to make some changes? And she said, yeah. And I just knew something was wrong with it. And I didn't quite know what it was. It was like I, I it was sort of like I left the house, but I forgot, you know, I forgot something. I didn't know what it was, that type of feeling. Um, so I read it again and read it again. So this is, this is late Friday night. I'm supposed to have it into, to, um, HarperCollins on, I was supposed to have it in on Friday. They gave me some Monday. All of a sudden it occurs to me. Oh man, I, I got to change this whole thing. I literally have to rewrite this whole thing. I can't submit this. And, um, so I literally, I write Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I don't sleep. I just, I, I just drink coffee and rewrite the entire manuscript in three wow. days. And I cut it in half from, uh, from like 86,000 words to 42,000, whatever it is, whatever it was. And on Monday, like, I just hit send and send it. <laughs> I don't call anybody. I don't say anything. And they've already seen the 86,000 word one, right? They've already gone through it. Yeah. And, and um, <laughs> so I get a call from like the, you know, the CEO at the time or I forget what, maybe the, I forget what it was. But anyway, I get a call. I'm like, hey, you know, uh, what happened? And I was like, you know, I read it on Friday night. I just didn't feel good about it. And I needed to make some changes. I'm like, obviously you did. I said, yeah, you know, I just, I, I, I figured that this is my only opportunity and I need to use everything, the, the length of the book, the content of the book, the cover, everything to convey a message of a feeling of a life cut short. And I can't do that with more words. So I have to use less. So I cut it in half. This is the final version. Uh, I'm standing by this. And I'm like, are you sure? Now I wasn't sure, right? But I always say that I am, you know? So um, I was like, I'm absolutely sure. There's no question in my mind. And they're like, okay, great. They And and then like two weeks later, the book came out. They didn't change anything. They took what I gave them and sent that through. And that's what got published. I literally cut it in half because I felt like I couldn't, I, I needed to use the entire book to convey this idea of a life cut short and, and I couldn't do it by like telling, I, I had to cut things out. I had to streamline it to give you this, this one feeling at the end of the book, like that. Wow. That's it. I want to back up a little bit in that. First off, that's a ballsy move. And that comes from somewhere inside of you. And there's something that, you know, your gut or your intuition or whatever it's going to be. But are you comfortable with those kind of things or is this something you knew but couldn't put your thing? Can you describe what, what you were sensing before you decided to chop that book in half and rewrite it in a weekend? Yeah. So I think every writer has this, you know, if it's good, or if it's not, or at least you get a sense for it. It's really scary to be a writer. It really is. I and mean, you're, you're putting out, I mean, Scott, I don't know about you, but I mean, you're, you're putting out like really, you know, like, you know, people are going to criticize it, right? And they pay their 20 bucks and they can go and put a one on Amazon, right? If they don't like it, you know? <laughs> That's what I and, do. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it, it, I, but I had, you know, this was different because it was a guy that I really respect and loved. You know what I mean? He was just an awesome guy. It would be, I wanted his legacy. I wanted it to mean something, you know, to, to his friends, to me, to the world. I wanted it to mean something of what his, of what he did in his short life. Um, so I didn't, I, I didn't want to have, um, I didn't want people to say, well, you know, I, I, I couldn't get through the book or, you know, it was too long or, you know, I didn't, I, I only wanted great reviews of it. And I only, I wanted people to be left at the end. I wanted them to feel like I wanted more. And, um, so I decided that, okay, the worst case scenario is that the publisher comes back to me and says, no, 
But I'm sure about this. And I know that if, if I don't honor Ryan in this way, that, you know, whatever comes, whatever comes out of the book, that, that people will be like, well, it was a good book, but I didn't, you know, I didn't really get it. So I wanted to make sure that, that I did it right. So yeah, it was just this really this gut feeling that said, okay, just do this, cut it in half. No matter what, just cut it in half. Just even, there were some stories I could have put in that would have built some, um, character of, of Ryan, but, but I think leaving them out built more character. Just leaving them out. The things that, there were things that, you know, him and I did that were fun and funny and things that he did that were really, I think, amazing. But I, I put enough in that you knew who he was, but not enough in that you got bored of his life or, or him. So, yeah, I mean, it just, it just comes. And when you sit down to write a book, it's a, it's the most, one of the most masochistic process you ever go through. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of work to write a book. How, how hard is it? Not, I mean, you hear this adage a lot uh, amongst writers: is write about what you know, because then it'll be great writing. So, how, how hard was it for you to write someone else's story? Um, I think about that a lot. Some, in some ways, I think it's easier for me to write, or it was easier for me to write Ryan's story. First of all, he wasn't here; it was my perspective. It was about more about Ryan's story and our friendship, so it was easy to do. Um, I think. For me, it's, it's, personally, it's easier for me to write someone else's story because I see it from their perspective, but I also bring my views into it because it's hard to see, I think, for, you know, for, for guys like, um, maybe Mike Day or others, um, I see things that they don't necessarily see about themselves. For example, I'll just give you one really good example. One day, Mike Day was talking to me about something, and he was describing like this this firefight they were in, and he was describing the the like the the like the he, he was telling me like oh they were shooting over our heads, and they were shooting you know five five sixes over our heads, and then they started shooting, and it occurred to me like wait a minute Mike is getting shot at, I don't know where he was but he, I forgot about all the other stuff, but he was describing a gunfight. Like a sommelier would describe why, you know what I mean? Like it was weird, and just listening to him describe like the sound of the crack of a seven six two is different from the sound of a crack of a five five six and a nine, right? But coming over your head, it occurred to me like I stopped kind of not listening to the story, but I started thinking about, wow, this is this is Mike in a gunfight. He's not even thinking about getting shot. He's thinking about where the bullets are coming from. What type of bullets they, like, so it, in that way, it's easier for me to describe things because I'm objective about, about what Mike's talking about. So it's easier for me to write from an objective standpoint than a subjective standpoint. So, so it's easier for me to write, I think, other people's story than to write my own. You know, it, I don't know, my, my story, whatever that is, it, it all seems kind of boring to us as, as when you live it, right? Well, you could, st- I mean, you still got the five day fast by Robert Vera in you. That, that's still there. <laughs> yes, your fitness. Yeah. Your five fitness days book. juice fast by Bob Vera. In 180, <laughs> yeah, this is going to be your thing. Like, yeah, health and wellness, and in less than 183 pages. <laughs> yeah. All book. Every book is shorter than the next. Yeah, just literally just one page, but. Yeah, I just, yeah. Just, Eat less. That's it. Really like, that's what, you know, people ask all the time, you know, what's the key to it? You can't out exercise your fork, right? Eat mm-hmm. less and move more. That's how you lose weight. <laughs> like, you know, that's it. But, I mean, literally. Hold on, I'm writing that down. That's it. Like, you don't have to do much more. Like, you know, just, just do that. But anyway, I, I really enjoy writing other people's stories because I think that I have a perspective that they wouldn't necessarily think of. Um, I, I really enjoy that. And, um, so, so Mike's book, I'm really interested in, in seeing how, uh, you know, how that comes out. And I, I think we'll do two books, one on his memoir and, not, and then one on resiliency, like how he got through a lot of the things he got through. So you're like the official biographer of Navy SEALs. Does anyone ever yeah. call you like a SEAL groupie? And I, you know what? It's weird because I, I never knew these guys that as they were Navy SEALs, right? I just never knew any of them. And... um you know, even Ryan, I didn't know it was a seal. I only met him afterwards. And 
So, no, I, I like you ask, like, how do you know these guys? It's strange. I really don't even know how I know them all. Like, I'll meet them at a, an event or something like that. Or um, one of the guys I worked with on a book project, Rich Peters, was the first Navy SEAL ever selected for SEAL Team 6. He was with SEAL Team 2. And then when the commander of SEAL Team 2, which is a guy named Richard Marcinko, started SEAL Team 6, he picked Rich um, to to uh, be on that team. And I worked with Rich on a book project. Um, that is a, that story is... Did I ever tell you that story? No, that, you never that, believed that one. That, that one is one I actually didn't believe. So I get a call from this guy, Rich Peters. He tells me a story that he was in... He was in Libya during the time of Gaddafi was deposed, right? He was doing some work over there. Long story of how he got over there. Anyway, Gaddafi thinks he's a spy. He tries to leave the country, and they pick up Rich, and they throw him in prison. They have no idea where Rich is. His family has no idea where he is. He's been, um, they're going to use Rich potentially as a pawn. There's a, NATO has imposed a blockage. Um, there's no way that he can get out. Um, and no one knows where he is, and everybody thinks he's dead. So the SEAL community is involved. They're going to try to come together and find him. All of a sudden, Rich's Pete, Rich, Rich's wife, and Rich Peters gets a call from a journalist named James Foley. Do you guys remember James Foley? No. James Foley was a journalist who got his head cut off by ISIS. Oh, right. Okay. For the Global about. Post. So mm-hmm. his his wife, Rich Peters, gets a wife uh, gets a call from from um, James Foley saying hey, your your husband's still alive. I know where he is. So I hear the story from Rich. He's like, yeah. So I'm in prison, and one day. I've been there for six months and one, and you know, just literally probably lost a hundred pounds already. And we just, just literally tortured, beaten, you know, trying to get me to confess to something. And he's 62 years old at the time. He's like, all of a sudden from the 220 outlet on the wall, I hear this, you know, hello, hello, is anybody in there? And, um, he's like, uh, you know, Rich calls back. Yeah. My name is Rich Spears. This is this. And he's like, James Foley. I'm a journalist. And Rich, oh, I'm Rich Spears. I'm, you know, I'm an American. I'm here. And, uh, um, Rich says that, um, you know, he's like, Hey, Jim, you know, tell me what happened. So Jim tells him that what happened that Jim was, was taken prisoner with two other journalists. Um, and, uh, he's been held by Gaddafi. Um, Jim asked Rich a bunch of questions about, did he go to court? Rich was never seen. No one knew where he was. Anyway, Rich says to Jim Foley, Hey, look, Jim, you're getting out of here. I'm not. Uh, they're probably going to kill me here, but I'm not. But here's what you're going to do. You're going to remember some personal details about me. And as soon as you get out, as soon as you get outside the country, you're to call my wife, tell her where you are, and tell them to send the boys. <laughs> so Jim Foley, so Rich Peters makes Jim Foley remember his social security number, all his personal details, and his wife's phone number. Jim gets out. He gets into Tunisia. His first call he makes is to Katie Peters and says, hey, your husband, Rich Peters, United States Navy SEAL, SEAL Team 6, social security number 02395, whatever it is, you know, I know where he is. And she's like, really so they end up finding rich peter rich you know they say we know you have rich you, you know you're holding him this is to Gaddafi's people they deny it at first they say look we, we know where he is we we got all this information then they admit to it and they say yeah we're going to hang him tomorrow in green square for treason or he's a traitor or something like that. i don't know what it was a spy tomorrow comes they, they start bombing you know they start bombing tripoli or the NATO starts bombing Tripoli, they start bombing around the place around the prison. Uh, all of a sudden, everybody, Rich tells me, everybody leaves the prison. So Rich is left in the prison. Now he thinks he's going to leave him there to die. So he says, so I just have this thought. I pray, I have this thought. All of a sudden, this thought comes to me in a prayer almost. It's like, kick down the door. So he's like, I'm in prison for six months. I've lost 100 pounds, and I get this idea. I'm going to kick down the door. So I just start kicking the door. And wouldn't you know it, after about the 30th kick, the, the 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 whole frame, the door just blows out of the, the cell. I'm like, wow. Kidding? So I so I don't believe it, right? I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, Rich, right? Because I don't really know Rich that well, you know. You gotta be kidding me. So I Google search James Foley, Rich Peters, and Global Post pops up. And James Foley wrote for Global Post. And it's returned to Libya. Jim Foley actually goes back to Libya finds Rich Peters, and there's a picture of them at the prison with the door that Rich kicked out of his prison cell. I mean, incredible story. So I meet these guys. I mean, 
just through sort of the SEAL community is really well connected. So they kind of all know of or know each other. So that's how I kind of connect with them all. And I live in Arizona, so a lot of them come through here. So we just meet up and they all kind of some, you know, one guy will know Ryan, one guy will know, you know, um, Jay or some other guys. And so that's how I connect with a lot of those guys. We could spend a whole hour just talking about the the guys we all know together and, and how immense the network is and how things we do, not only on Pete's show, but the things you're doing with, you know, Patriot Authors Magazine and Eagle Rise Speaker Bureau. It, it's it's an amazing network. Yeah. The people helping people. And it, it's not exclusive to veterans. That's what's cool with what you got going on is, you know, you share the love too. And I think we talk, it's a common theme whenever I'm on the show with Pete. Yeah. You know, how cool this network is because it's an important message I'd like to tell people is like, if there's any listeners listening to show around the world and they need help with something, just ask. Yeah. Just send me an email. Go to echoandramadi.com. Send me an email, and I respond. And if I can help, I'll help. And it's that easy. And you probably know someone that can help them, or you know, so at least someone to I get continue Vera. their quest. Yeah, so, totally. <laughs> I go. Do you know Robert? And then I do. Yeah. This is the thing too. So election day is about to happen here in about a week, and everybody's always like, "Vote, vote, vote!" And yes, of course, everybody should vote, but. Fuck that. You can do so much more and impact people's lives, impact your own life. Get involved, whether or not you're donating your time to an organization like Save the Brave or you're getting involved somewhere else, like whatever you're passionate about. There's literally a club that raises canaries for show. You know, you can improve your life. You can improve the lives of others by just simply getting instead of like focusing on negative stuff. Get in, if you don't like the government, go to it and get involved in it and start to change it from the inside. Yeah, you know, there's all kinds of ways. You don't got to be elected. There's people that need help. There's volunteer time. So that's my big uh, soapboxy thing as we hit up on, on election day. And I'm, I've got a political scientist here on the show with me. Get get fucking involved. Value your rights more than just fucking voting. Get out there and go get involved and help someone. That's my uh, that's my big speech as we uh, round the corner here. Uh, Robert, when's the new book coming out? Uh, it's probably 2020. I think we're on that schedule, so we're we're um, on 2020. Of course, A Warrior's Faith is still available on Amazon, um, and I'm, the, it's un- my day's new book is untitled, but I'm sure you know uh, I'll get you information on that when it does come out. But and and of course, Echo and Amadi. But I would like to give a plug for the Patriot Authors Network. It's a network of 30 like-minded authors, many in the military, many not, but amazing stories. We all help to promote each other. Um, so the Patriot Authors Network is housed at um, American Patriot Unsung Magazine. 30 authors, including guys like Scott McEwen, Scott Husing, um, Josh Montz, Jay Redman, Mike Day will be there eventually. But um, amazing group of... of Sean Parnell. Who's Sean, Parnell. Yeah, Sean Parnell. Um, Man of War just came out. Great book. Um, selfless leaders and uh, just incredible stories. I mean, like incredible stories. Very well written. So... Um, but a great network of people. So I'll let you know when when um, new the new one's coming out. But thank you. Yeah, and you can find more on Robert at A Warrior's Faith. And you can also check out his book on Amazon, A Warrior's Faith. Real simple. You can get him on Facebook. He's really approachable. He wants to talk to you. You guys should talk to him. And buy these books. If you've read the book for yourself, get it for somebody else as a gift. Here, here's how you help out. If you're going to buy the book, go into Amazon rate it and review it that is what helps drive these things and lets robert go out and tell these incredible stories because if no one else has thanked you today robert i'm going to thank you for doing that because uh you know there's there's a thousand more guys that are, have done incredible things whether or not they've been shot 27 times or you know they've lost their sight or or they just went out and and like ryan weaver you know used the incredible loss that he's felt to put himself on stage and sing country songs for uh PBR fans all over the nation, and it's just incredible. So, thank you for doing that. It's my honor, literally, my honor to, to be able to do it. To have the privilege to be able to do it. So, it's my honor. So, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to get to talk. I know yeah. we can we we can chat like schoolgirls for hours. <laughs> man. I mean, Robert get on the phone. So, uh, it's always good talking, man. We always yeah, got crazy. a thousand ideas of great things we want to do, and um, you know, you're doing it, and. We get bogged down in that a lot is we want to do so much, do more and do more and do more. And people like Robert and, and Pete and 
Nick Velez and Josh and everybody, man, by sharing stories and helping out, they're they're doing something. And it, but guys that do that also feel like they need to be doing more. And I think that's what drives us. And you're definitely one of those guys, man. I'm very proud to have you in my network and you know call you uh, not only a fellow author but uh, friend. More plus Same here, brother. Same here. No, it's awesome. But thank you guys. I really appreciate the time with you. And um, I'd love to do it again. There's some other stuff I got coming up. And hopefully in the next couple of months we can do it. I think it'll be a lot of fun. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>